This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amaretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Well, a little change up on the intro music there, and this is in honor of Mississippi Chris. Uh, he's a he's a country boy, uh, true as they come. So uh, I don't know if Chris even listens to these damn shows or not. <laughs> Do you? Have you listened to one of your shows yet, Mississippi? Did we lose him already? Nope, I was on mute. Sorry. Uh, well, I, I changed up the intro song here just a little bit. Uh, a little bit of boot scratching on a hardwood floor, some banjos playing in the background. Uh, you know the stuff, a little country western gig there. So uh, that was in honor of uh, Mississippi Chris. So. <laughs> yeah. I do listen. I just skip my part because I don't like to hear myself talk. I, I don't either. <laughs> uh Hey, welcome to the Mead House. Um, we're uh, a show about making mead, good mead at home. And, uh, you know, we sit here and talk about uh, doing some different things. Uh, and this is kind of where it all starts, right here at home. Uh, you know, so uh, even if you're thinking about opening up a meadery someday, uh, you know, first you got to be doing it pretty good at home and uh, making good batches at your friends and relatives and Everybody that you give it to, uh, you know, will enjoy. So uh, with that being said, uh, we're on every Tuesday night, 9 o'clock live right here on the meathouse.com. Uh, that's our house. So uh, you can also download the show from there. You can catch it on iTunes if you have an iTunes uh, deal. Uh, we're also on TuneIn Radio. I keep forgetting to mention that. Uh, if you're listening live, you can catch the show live on TuneIn Radio uh, it's a pretty cool place. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of different internet radio stations over there, just about any any kind of music, any kind of subject. Uh, it's uh, it's a pretty cool place. So uh, tune in dot com if you want to catch the show over there. Uh, the Twitter thing, sorry, uh, the only Twitter and tweeting thing that what we do is uh, you know every time a post goes up on the website, it it there's there's like this plug-in thing. That I, all I do is just kind of fill out the information, and then when I write a post, it just blasts it out to the Facebook and to the uh, Twitter thing. So, um, so if you respond to us on on Twitter, it's a good chance of hey, you know what, nobody's going to see it anyway. So, <laughs> but we like to let you know what's going on. Uh, let's see, the Facebook's real simple, the Mead House. Uh, the call in number, if uh, you know, we. we I, I should really probably dump that number. Nobody ever calls in. Uh, 818-921-4680 if you want to if you want to call in. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll take anybody's call. Um, we're uh, – well, I, I was going to do a couple of shout Well, first of all, let's uh, what do, do the what are we drinking. I'll start it off. I'm, I'm actually finishing – you know, and – my hat's off to Sergio again. I'm, I'm, I'm finally finishing off the last two bottles um, of, uh, of Sergio Mutella from uh, uh, Melovino Meadery. He sent us uh, uh, several bottles each year. I'm, I'm drinking uh, two bottles tonight, actually, finishing them both off all night long. And I don't have my glasses on, but it's, I, I know that's the uh, coffee uh, made with espresso, espresso. And I believe what Sergio does there is he, he makes up a cold brew and then uh, mixes it into a traditional. Uh, it comes out rather nice. Uh, I really I like the coffee taste he's got in it. That's what I really like about that. That's got the level of coffee that I'm looking for in mine. And then this uh, Tempted to Touch, I think this is the one with that cocoa. I can't see the damn label because I don't have my glasses uh, on me, but... Uh, I believe this is with a cocoa and, and vanilla, uh, I believe, but uh, it's not bad either. I, I, I kind of enjoy that. A little, little on the sweet side, but uh, it's good stuff. Uh, 
Jeff, what's in your cup tonight? Actually, I have a bottle. I uh, I broke the tradition a little bit, and uh, I got a. They had a fantastic deal on Love to Brew uh, a few months back on uh, their IPA kits. So I bought myself an English IPA kit, and I'm uh, enjoying the, the first of many of these bottles here. It's a nice uh, nice break from traditional like American IPAs, and that it's more English hops. So it's got like more of a dark and uh, not dark. Um, what do I want to say? More of an earthy flavor to it than a like a, a, a citrus fruit kind of a flavor to it. Um, oh, yeah. But it's all around pretty nice. It's really hot and muggy out tonight, so I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Cool. Mississippi Chris, what you got in your mug tonight, buddy? Well, I'm I'm right with you. I've got uh, the rest of the All Night Long and uh, the Tempted to Touch, chocolate vanilla. Uh, I was going to ask you, did you notice that uh, since this bottle of coffee mead's been opened from Sergio did you notice it's changed a little bit? The coffee's actually come out a little bit more now that it's had time to sort of breathe a little bit? Yes, I have. Uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. That, that, that's that got just about the right amount of coffee flavor that I'm looking for in the coffee projects that we've got going. Uh, yeah, I, I the really like was- it. It was good to begin with, but it was a, it was a little bit muted. Not much, but uh, since it's been sitting in the fridge for for the past week, uh, the coffee's really come out. I think it may be a little bit of oxygen did it some good. Yeah, I was kind of wondering the same thing. Uh, you know, mine was opened. Uh, there's probably, I don't know, maybe uh, I'm looking, maybe maybe about uh, one more glass in there. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, if that didn't have something to do with it, you know, uh, pop the cork and leave it open for a little bit, and then uh, you know a little bit of oxygen uh, gets to it. So I was having a hard time deciding uh, amongst all these needs, uh, but I, I'm going to have to say if um, if I was going to order a case of any of these, it would be the tempted to touch. I, I'm liking this chocolate vanilla probably because I've got sort of the same interest right now in using chocolate that I do with using coffee, except that I've actually managed to get chocolate to work. <laughs> and so uh, yeah. uh, I, I, wonder, I, I, would, I I like this tempted to touch. I, I wonder, uh, I, the, the, the chocolate, the cocoa, uh, getting a coffee-like, is that coming from the cocoa? Do you think? Is that? Uh, I don't know, for some reason, I just I, I just get this coffee, and then I get the chocolate. You know? Yeah, I'm wondering. Uh, I know he uses cocoa nibs. I think he said. I'm wondering if he toasted those or or just used them raw. Uh, I don't believe I heard him say. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and I was, uh, Sergio, I know listens to the show. So Sergio, if you're out there. Uh, uh, give me a holler, shoot me an email, or catch me on Facebook, and and let me know what you do to those cocoa nibs. If you do toast them, uh, this is that tempted to touch, and I'm I'm getting this I'm getting this very slight coffee, and then I get the cocoa. Uh, I get the cocoa more on the back end more than anything, but uh, uh, it's good. I, I drink I like so it. much coffee. I drink so much coffee. I taste coffee and everything. So yeah. Because it's usually never been more than 10 minutes since I had a cup of coffee. So, <laughs> Hell, I even make rubs out of it, out of coffee grounds, and put them on pork roast. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is the coffee yeah. nation. Maybe we should do a show on coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, no, I, I would you, be boring because my answer would always be the same. You say, yeah. Dark <laughs> roast Starbucks. <laughs> well. I don't know. I about think we would all be in agreement there, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was, we just do every show every week. We talk about dark roast Starbucks. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, well Starbucks uh, is a little bitter for my taste, but yeah, dark roast is the way to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm definitely. I, mean, I just like a nice, good, rich, robust uh, coffee, and it's got to be some kind of a dark roast. And uh, I actually prefer the. Sumatra and Arabica; those are my two go-to beans by far. 
Um, but if if we could get a, a sponsorship from Keurig, I would seriously consider it. <laughs> yeah, fat chance, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. But if anyone out there is listening, you know, <laughs> yeah, if anybody yeah. works for Keurig, um, I know. Uh, you but know, we don't get a we don't get a whole lot of people on the live show, but man, our downloads are like through the roof. I mean, we're the hundreds of hundreds of people are downloading the show. So uh, I'm hoping they're uh, hoping they're having fun out there. So uh, keep it coming. A um, mm-hmm. couple of shout outs I want to get out of the way here before we get into kind of the meat of things here tonight. Uh, Scott Monroe of Corinth. That's a familiar place, isn't it? Uh, or I guess, how, how do you say it? Corinth. How, Corinth, how do I say yeah. it? Corinth. Uh, Corinth, Mississippi. Corinth, like Corinth, Greece. Yeah, he uh, Scott. Uh, he started this cherry mead. Uh, he's doing a one gallon batch, and he started. I believe it was the day after our show aired last week, and uh, he listened very intently and uh, uh, put this thing together. He's been posting his uh, his gravities uh, pretty much daily on the Facebook page. He started out at one point one four four. We said that was okay. Uh, you know, when it started, and he's now down to 1.036 with it. So uh, best of luck there, Scott. Hope it turns out good. Uh, and let us know uh, if it does. So we'd like to get your tasting notes on it when it completes uh, itself. Um, another shout-out to Patricia Gwen Edwards. Uh, caught up with her on the Mead, uh, on the Mead Facebook group. And uh, she uh, she's been following along the show too. She built herself a DIY cooling system based off the same system that I have, and uh, she's off to a pretty good start. She uh, put some pictures up there on that Facebook group page, Facebook group, and uh, did some work on the uh, on the cooler to accommodate the supply and the return lines. looks Looks cool. Looks like a DIY project to me good stuff and uh, awesome job Patricia so uh, big shout out uh, to her tonight uh, for that I I also got an update on mine Um, you know and and some some people are probably going to say that you know geez JD you're getting kind of ritzy with your system why don't you just buy a refrigerator well I spent almost $300 on a 48 quart Actually, a 45 quart cooler. It's not even 48 quart uh, today, and it's supposed to arrive next week. And uh, the reason why I spent that much money is because this is a cooler that will actually keep ice for up to 10 days. Not that I'm looking for 10 days. I, I'm, you know, I'm sure that those are probably under uh, best of conditions. But if I can get five to seven days out of it, uh, I'll be sitting pretty. Uh, I'll re- I really like that. Okay, that's going to really increase the efficiency factor here. Um, it takes uh, for for the block ice that I that I freeze because I, I do all my own. I don't buy ice. Uh, and I freeze block ice, and it takes a long time to freeze. It takes almost three days to freeze the block ice that I do. Uh, I do, let's see, two, four, I do four and a half gallons of, uh, of block ice in three different containers. And, uh, you know, like I say, it takes three days for that to happen. So the problem I'm having right now is the ambient temperature inside the house is above 75 degrees. It was 78 degrees yesterday inside the house. It was 113 degrees here yesterday. And so that kind of blows out the efficiency of the old Coleman cooler. So I was down to about 10 or 12 hours on ice at that point. So... Uh, when the ambient temperature uh, in the house is around 68 to 70 degrees, I can almost get my 40 hours uh, plus out of it. But uh, with this new cooler coming, I'm looking at probably 60 plus hours uh, at least. Uh, so uh, 
uh, really looking forward to that when it gets here. And of course, it'll be it'll be uh, uh, adjusted and worked on and uh, drilled and you know uh, put all my fittings in and get all my uh, my uh, return and my supply and return lines put in and and everything for the pump. So uh, really, really looking forward to that. Uh, the uh, you know and I. I know Chris. Uh, well, here here's the deal, okay. And I know Chris. Uh, Chris is in love with his little refrigerator. He's got these little apartment sized jobs that uh, that he uses. And not anymore. Power. Oh no! Oh no! Nope. What happened? No, nope. it went kaput. <laughs> oh God! Oh no! Oh no! Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. I've got t-shirts wrapped around all my buckets, uh, oh, my. sitting in water with a fan <laughs> blowing on them. Oh man. Uh, and would you believe, would you believe that I'm keeping everything at about 62 to 64 degrees like that? There you go. It works like a charm. It works. And now this is assuming that you have a, a cool house. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got, uh, I, I keep my house uh, really cool because I'm, I'm kind of hot natured anyway. So uh, I keep it cool in here, but uh uh, usually around 68 degrees, uh, but I'm I'm maintaining about 62 degrees with with the old swamp cooler technique, and it's working like a charm. So, yep. Yep. I mean, the problem is the uh, the coffee experiment was in there when the thing quit, and I don't know. <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know exactly when it quit. So, I'm hoping I don't have rocket fuel. Well, uh, you know, if it's a, if it a matter of hours, or are we talking days, or I don't know, uh, oh. <laughs> because you know, once I once I did the final stir on it, the final degassing, then you airlock it and leave it alone for two weeks. Yeah, and I just happened to go by and realized that uh, you know a few days later that it wasn't working. So I don't know if it had been a few hours or if it had been days. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, it was far enough along in the fermentation that it's not an issue. Uh, yeah. But we'll find out. You you do have plans on replacing it, don't you? Uh, you know, actually, I don't think I'm going to uh, because I can only fit one thing in at a time, and yeah. that that's kind of a hassle. So I think I'm just going to go with your your Rube Goldberg setup, and uh, that way I can I can hook up as much copper line as I want to. I can make as many coils as I want to to go around the buckets and um, just yeah. run them all off off the coolers. And uh, you know it's just as accurate, if not more accurate, and it's just as efficient and. You know, uh, a four degree, um, I ferment on the low end of the spectrum anyway. So 62 degrees for me is, is a good fermentation, but you know, 62 to 66 is perfectly acceptable. So even anything within that four degree range is, is good. So yeah, as long as I can maintain that, I'm not worried about it. Yeah. I, um, you know, the, and you kind of said it right there. I mean, one of the reasons why I I, I looked into using a, a little apartment size, you know, refrigerator for fermenting, uh, or even for storing for aging. But the problem is, you can only get one. They're only big enough for one five gallon bucket, carboy, what have you. Uh, mm-hmm. Even if you're just using three gallons, so it, it really didn't make sense if that's all that I could. You know, because I've got a lot more going than that, uh, and it just didn't make sense. So. Uh, I mean, it's a simple investment. I mean, hell, you can pick them up new for less than 130 bucks. Uh, Home Depot's got boatloads of them uh, every time I go there. Uh, in fact, yep. I've, I've seen sales on them as low as $99. So, you know, if you're... Well, folks, you know, I think the point here, uh, make JD's uh, uh, cooler set up if you can. But if you if you can't, if you're not mechanically inclined or, and you don't want to do that, uh, don't be afraid to put a T-shirt around that thing and set it 
in a in a pan of water, turn a fan on it, you will be surprised. You can drop that thing ten degrees uh, easily by doing that. Old school. Now, if you've got a yeah. tall bucket, if you, if you've got a really tall bucket, what I would what I would suggest doing is get you get you a spray bottle. And uh, just occasionally, when you walk by, spray the top of that T-shirt to keep it damp because the water may not wick up or the fan may dry it out faster than it can wick up. And it's that evaporation that's doing the cooling. So you might want to get you a spray bottle and and make sure that T-shirt stays damp. Uh, But you can, you know, there's no excuse not to control your temperatures to some degree. No, and, and, you know, that's why, uh, you know, when I first learned about it and I started thinking about, you know, what, what can I do here at home um, to, I mean, you know, I, I did solve part of the problem by going to stainless steel fermenters with a whole immersion chiller, but the two, the two setups that I have is over a $1,000, so... Uh, that being said, I mean, you know, what do you do when it's done? Well, I can leave it sit out here in, you know, 75-degree weather. Uh, but the cooler, the better, even when you're aging. So that was one of my concerns as well. So, uh, you know, and it works. That's why I put this little DIY system. And you can ferment with it, too. I mean, it's not just for aging. I mean, uh, if I wanted to start a third fermenter uh, in a bucket or a, or a carboy, uh, I just simply, uh, you know, put one of the coils of copper around it, put my little insulation blanket around it, and uh, I'm good to go. So, uh, but yeah, Chris, I mean, Chris is right. I mean, there is no excuse for controlling your temperatures, and we've talked, you know, numerous times. That's probably the number one mistake that everybody makes when they first start out. And wonder why they have rocket fuel in their in their carboy when they you know go to taste a take a drink of it. So, Jeff, um, what are you doing for your, for your temperature control up there? Well, actually, at the moment, I've got uh, I've got very little going on. I've got uh, uh, some under the cabinet space that I'm using for fermenting in, and it tends to stay a few degrees cooler than the rest of the house. Um, so that's about as good as, as good as I've got. Um, I did get a temperature controller set up, and uh, I'm kind of slowly taking apart this fridge and figuring out how I'm going to wire everything together. Um, but I figure I can get two separate, uh, oh, what do I want to say, two separate um, uh, temperature-controlled areas um, between the freezer area and the re- refrigerator area. Um, or I'm, I might end up trying to take out the, the wall between the two and have one single area. Uh, a little undecided on that point, but yeah, it's a work in progress for me here too. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, you can almost make up, uh, you know, if you can seal off the the one area, insulate some kind of a shelf unit in there, and actually have two different, uh, uh, you know, cold uh, cold storage or cold rooms, I guess you'd say. Um, that that might be nice if I try to go into like using log or yeast or something. I've heard that can be interesting. Um, yeah. So that might be some worth trying at some point. Yeah, cool. That would require a lot cooler temperature, so, you know. Well, you know, here here we go again. I mean, a DIY project that uh, Jeff's working on uh, to keep his temperatures under control, and then uh, Chris is, you know, I mean, old school. There, there's there's a lot to be said for old school, you know. Uh, it just works. So, uh, but enough on temperature control. Um, let's uh, let's go back to Chris. Uh, we we started this mead project last week, and it's a simple, uh, you know, it's like the orange blossom special that we did here a while back. Which, if you haven't bottled yet, it's probably ready for bottling now, or you could just keep it in the carboy and just keep on aging it. Mead does get better with time. But this cherry mead, Chris, uh, it, it was a simple recipe. Uh, what was it again? Uh, we used the uh, the tart cherry concentrate from Fruit Fast. Um, we diluted it down to its normal concentration, but then we took it a little bit further. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about why I did this. Um, Normally, when I make my cherry melomels, I would not dilute it any further. Uh, that one quart was meant to make uh, two two gallons even at normal concentration. 
So normally on my cherry melomels, I would do that. I would I would get it to uh, its normal concentration, and that replaces your water. So you just take out the water, use the cherry juice, add the honey to you know, 1154 and use 71B, and that would be my normal cherry melomel. But I, I did a little um, uh, altering to this because, well, for several reasons, not everyone likes as strong of a cherry melomel as I normally make. Uh, but I wanted to use this as a teaching uh, opportunity this is this is an opportunity for people to learn. You know, we see people all the time saying that they're starting a mead and they're putting acid in up front, they're putting tannins in up front, and uh, um, people ask questions about how do you back sweeten when you need to, and uh, what happens if it's too dry or too tart, or you know, how do you adjust your meads? So I thought that. I'll, I will just engineer this recipe so that we can use it as as a teaching example. So um, another reason that I wanted to dilute that juice a little bit more is because uh, um, I wanted to make room in the flavor. I wanted to weaken the cherry just a little bit because we're going to do something interesting in secondary, we're going to turn this into a cherry chocolate uh, mead. Oh. Is that like those chocolate and, covered cherries that come out at Christmas time all the time? Yeah, yeah. You know, but but I don't want people to get that notion because it's not going to be that kind of in your face chocolate. Uh, we're, we're using, we're, we're using the chocolate because it's a good source of tannins and, uh, we're, we're getting very little tannin from the cherry juice. Now, if we had the full, you know, if we had whole fruit and had the skins, we would get more tannin, but from the concentrate, we're not getting as much. So the chocolate's going to be our source of, of tannins. Uh, not to mention adding some more flavor and, and another dimension to it. We're also going to use some crushed molub, which is going to help to uh, give it this whole other character that uh, it almost uh, mimics using vanilla, but without the vanilla flavor. Um, sort of a bready kind of taste like you would get in a cherry pie. So it's going to be a very interesting flavor. It's going to be really good. Um, so something else that we did is I gave a range on the starting gravity, um, <clears throat> uh, anywhere from 1140 to 1154 is acceptable for your starting gravity. Um, and what that's going to do, it's going to cause everybody to end up at a slightly different place. And you're going to be able to, to detect the tartness from the cherries and the sweetness that's left. And then once we get into tertiary, we're going to learn about how to do uh, acid adjustments, sweetness adjustments. And we're going to do it the right way. Rather than dumping all this stuff in right off the bat, uh, it makes no sense to put acid blend in at the beginning when you don't know if it's going to need it or not. So we're going to use this as a as a learning experience, and uh, and we're going to learn how to adjust at the right times. Um, so we'll we'll talk more about that next week uh, when we uh, start talking about what we're going to do in secondary. Uh, as of right now, this particular mead, the batch that I've got going, this is day seven. So tonight, when after the show, I'll do my final. Uh, degassing, and then it'll just sit for another two weeks. Uh, I checked the gravity this morning, and I've dropped, uh, let's see, I started mine at 1140, um, and I was at uh, 1060, so I've dropped a total of 80 points, um, and it's probably dropped another six or so since this morning, so I dropped about 86 points in seven days. That's wow. a good, moderate, moderately slow, steady fermentation. 
you don't want the thing to get too fast. Uh, when you have a, a really fast fermentation, you're accomplishing two things. You're blowing out a lot of your flavor and aromatics out the airlock, and you're probably creating rocket fuel because in order to get some ridiculously fast fermentation, it's probably going to be, the temperature is going to be too high. And uh, so you don't want it too fast. You want it good and slow. When I hear people, uh, see people on the Internet, they almost brag about how fast their fermentation went. And they act like it's something to be proud of. It's not. You don't want that. Uh, and I don't know where people get that idea from, but a good, slow, steady fermentation, it preserves your flavor. It preserves the aromatics. It means that your temperature is low enough so that you're not creating rocket fuel. And it just, it, 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 it ages faster. It's ready to drink sooner. So keep it slow and steady. Yeah. Well, uh, so this, uh, I mean, when can we expect to be able to get this thing into secondary? Uh, we're looking at 21 days from the day that we uh, pitched the yeast. So we've got two more weeks from today. I think it's July 5th will be the day that it needs to go uh, into secondary. And we've posted a list of ingredients and equipment you're going to need uh, to go ahead and get together for secondary. You're going to need a three-gallon uh, glass carboy with a stopper and airlock. You're going to need a racking cane, uh, 12 ounces of Dutch processed cocoa, uh, about a half a cup of molub. Molub is denatured uh, cherry pits. And yeah. um, you can get them whole or ground. I usually get mine whole and just crush them, put them in a thick plastic um, freezer bag or something and crush them with a hammer. They've only got to be cracked open, just coarsely crushed. Um, if you taste one before you put it in, you're going to say, well, this has no flavor at all. Uh, and it really doesn't by itself, but it really adds a lot to the mead. So... Uh, you can get those things from pensies and things like that. Chew, chew on a hop pellet and ask yourself, why the hell would they put that in beer? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I, I know Jeff makes beer. You've made beer, right? Um, I make kid beer mainly. I mean, I've done uh, a couple small ones, but. Yeah, but I mean, even the kit beers, uh, the one, the two that I have here that I have yet to make yet, I mean, it comes with hops and stuff. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I opened up the little hop package and, and took a little chunk off and put it in my mouth. And I thought, holy crap, why would anybody put that in a beer? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, <laughs> it might not taste anything right off the bat, but, you know, uh, you never know what it's going to do to the meat. I mean, it's going to, you know, so... But I'm looking forward to doing a cherry. I've got one here that uh, actually it's not a full cherry, and it's not even close to the recipe that uh, that we started here. So I want to do another one, but I want to do it uh, using the recipe that we were talking about here tonight. So um, yeah, you know, uh, if you know, I want, I want you and and Jeff to talk for a while, but and I'm going to step aside while you do, but. Before you do, if y'all don't mind, if y'all could scoot over just a little bit so I can pull my soapbox in here. That's all right. Get the uh, soapbox out. <laughs> I'll get the soapbox because I need to address uh, three emails that I received this week. Uh, and I'm assuming they must have got my email from the forums or something. I, I hardly ever go on there anymore. But uh, anyway, I got three emails about this cherry mead. Uh, I got an email from a lady in Idaho. Uh, I got one from a lady in Arkansas. And I got another email from a guy in South Dakota. Wow. <clears throat> and they all started out by saying they were enjoying uh, listening to the show. They, in, they were doing the cheery meet along with us. They were excited okay. about it. They, were, they couldn't wait to hear it to see what the results were going to be. And they said, uh, we're, we're following the recipe exactly, except, and that's where things went bad. 
Oh, wow. Uh, you can't put accept and exactly together in that sentence. Right. Um, you're either following it exactly or you're not doing it at all. Uh, so this one lady from Idaho, she says that she's using uh, great value clover honey from Walmart. That's not in the recipe. Yeah, uh, I don't know that I'd be using. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, she says that uh, she has always heard that you can't start at a gravity that high. So she decided to start hers at 1120. That's not in the recipe. No, that's not. Um, and she is using D254 yeast. That's not in the recipe. That's, no, that's not in the recipe either. Okay. Now, let's go to the lady who emailed from Arkansas. She says that she is using uh, mesquite honey from Trader Joe's. That's not in the recipe. Yeah, no, and I don't uh, think I, I don't think I'd be using that in a cherry mead to begin with, but that's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, uh, she is she couldn't find uh, locally the the cherry concentrate, but she did find a mix of a cherry mango. So she's using that. That's not in the recipe. No, no, that's not, uh, that's not in it either. <laughs> she's using. Uh, she is using. D47 yeast. That's not in the recipe. Mm. Uh, and she likes, she says, I prefer meads that are about 12% ABV and dry. So I decided to start this at 1092. I'm looking forward to the results. Can't wait. Uh, mm. That's not in the recipe. <clears throat> no. <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, let's go to the email from the guy from South Dakota. He says, uh, "I'm doing the recipe along with you, except I've decided to use a uh, local wildflower honey." Okay, that's good. You using the local wildflower honey? That is uh, in the recipe. Said, <laughs> that is in the recipe, um, and he did use the right uh, cherry juice. Uh, he did do everything else correctly. He says, though, that he is using D47 yeast as well. That's not in the recipe. Yeah. Uh, now, he says that, he says, once I got the mess mixed up, I was so far over three gallons that I decided to go ahead and make it a full five-gallon batch. So I added spring water to five and a quarter gallons uh, without any regard for gravity or anything like that. He just started adding spring water, and that's now, not in the recipe. Well, it's it, it's not even it's not even going to be cherry Kool Aid because uh, this is only one quart of concentrate, right? Right, right. And uh, so here, here's the deal. The, I've got three emails here from three different people in three different parts of the country, and we're batting 100% deviation from the recipe. Yeah. Uh, and it's going to turn out horrible. Now, people might think, well, why do you care? It's not your, your mead. You're not ruining it. Well, no, I'm not. Uh, but here's what's going to happen. These people, in their minds, they think they're following the recipe. Uh, they don't realize these changes are uh, significant. Yeah. So what's going to happen? They're going to get on the Internet. They're going to get on the forums, and they're going to say, I made Chris's recipe, and it turned out like crap. No, so he I doesn't made, apparently no, no, know, know what he's talking about. No, no, no. It's going to be, I made... Mississippi Chris Spencer's cherry mead that lives in Mississippi. I made his mead. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. I did. I it, didn't make JD's mead or just mead. I made Mississippi Chris Spencer from Corinth, Mississippi. I made his mead. <laughs> uh huh. And he yeah. doesn't know what he's talking about because. Uh, it, I made it, and it turned out like crap. And they won't mention the fact that they used, well, that they didn't follow the recipe at all. Yeah. 
they used different honey, different juice, different yeast, different nutrient schedule. One, the, the guy from South Dakota, he used the DAP and Fermate K, and he did. He says he didn't know exactly how much to add for it since it was scaled up to five gallons, so he just decided a teaspoon of each would be good. <laughs> um, yeah. Different yeast, different batch sizes, different gravities that were out of the range. Nobody that emailed me, um, these three people, followed the recipe at all. Yeah. So uh, don't go on the forums and tell people that you made my recipe and that that it turned out awful because uh, you didn't make my recipe. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and, you know, the, rest, the recipes that we're going to put up are, are – these are not – that's why you haven't seen any of mine up yet because I haven't made any that I have – a hundred percent confidence in that this is going to be good to go. Okay, I'm still kind of on a learning curve here too. This is one of the reasons why we do this show. Um, there's uh, there's a reason why we only put recipes that we put up, and that's because we know they work. And the reason why we know they work is because one of one of the other two guys on this show has done it with success. And uh, and it came out good. So and, and if you deviate from that, you know it's hard for us to sit here and talk about the outcome that we get off of the mead recipes we put together on the show, knowing that you're probably sitting sitting there scratching your head, wondering, I don't taste that. Uh, mine's you know much different than that. I don't get that aroma. I don't have that taste. Uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, uh, no, know. but here, here's, you know, I, I don't want people to think that I'm discouraging experimentation. Uh, I'm all for oh. experimentation. But here, here's the thing. Don't start experimenting until you know what you're doing. And if you're, uh, if you're at the point where you don't realize that changing yeast is a big deal, then you're not at a point where you know what you're doing yet. Yeah. Yeah. If you I'm don't not... realize, you know, if you don't realize these changes are important, then you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you don't need to be experimenting yet. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm going to tell you about changing use here in a little bit on something that I did that I'm now struggling with. Uh, but at any rate, uh, well, and if I could add so the, I'm off my the, uh, the other side, uh, y'all can scoot back in. Uh. <laughs> I yeah, was going to say ahead, the yeah. other side of this, though. You know, if somebody had innovated like that and uh, they had achieved really great results, you you can be sure they would say, "I did Chris's recipe, but I did this, and it turned out awesome." So, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the important thing is to to say, you know, I did this and I didn't do this. Um, and you know, you kind of if you're going to deviate from the recipe, you have to own that whether it turned out good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't care what people do with my recipe, uh, but if you change it, just don't tell people it was my recipe because if you change it, it's not my recipe. Well, yeah. Uh, exactly. just, just tell them, say, look, I found this recipe online and I made some changes to it and here's what happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's fine. And, and by all means, experiment. But if you don't know what you're doing, if you're a novice, uh, find a, a proven recipe. Now, if you don't trust me, if you don't trust us, or if you don't think that, you know, our recipes sound like something you'd like, then find, find one from some, you know, somewhere else to do. But, but whatever you do, if you, if you're using a proven recipe, follow it. Don't deviate from it because, um, this thing is engineered for a reason. It's set up this way to, you know, how many times have we said you've got to balance tartness and sweetness? You've got to, you've got to come out with the right finishing gravity range. Um, how, how you, uh, handle secondary, how you, uh, the yeast you, that you use and how you feed it. This is all important stuff and it's there for a reason. So, 
um, you know, managing a, a three gallon batch is different than managing a five gallon or a one gallon. And it's not all that different, but you know, there's things that have to be taken into consideration. And this was, I thought this was pretty straightforward and simple, but for some reason it, it must not have been. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the, uh, hang on there, Scott. That's the dangerous thing about, you know, uh, you know, but you, you copy these recipes and then you alter them and say, yeah, I did so-and-so's recipe, but it turned out like crap. Well, uh, you know, you got to follow these recipes uh, as they're laid out, uh, uh, you know, especially when you're dealing with, with a show like this. I know we used to struggle with it over at God Mead. Uh, people would call in with problems, and, and rather than tell us everything they knew about their mead, you don't get the you, you don't get any of the ingredients, and then you're asked to diagnose, you know, what the issue is, and you you can't do that if you don't know all the you know it's like playing doctor. I mean, if you know you got to look at all the symptoms. Well, how do you know what the symptoms are unless you know what you're dealing with? Uh, yeah, and you know, hey, if you want to if you want to experiment. Here, here's a, here's the approach to take. Make the recipe first uh, by the book. Do it letter for letter, yeah. uh, and then taste it. And and then ask yourself now, what do I want to change and do different? Yeah. And then experiment. But at least know what that recipe tastes like when it's done properly first, and then you can do your, uh, you know, your changes. Yeah. Scott Monroe from Corinth, Mississippi, joining us on the show. I apologize, Scott. The, you know, since Microsoft has taken over this damn Skype, thing, even the, some of the buttons have changed. And when people call the show, a little button shows up and says, add this call to conversation. Well, that button's not there anymore. So I had to call you. So I know you've been trying to no call. Problem. So. Uh, uh, Scott Monroe, guys, uh, he was uh, he's an avid listener of the show. And he uh, was listening last week when we started this cherry thing. And uh, he's, uh, he's working on the same recipe. Now, now, to stay off of Chris's soapbox, did you put it together verbatim? <laughs> uh, yeah, I followed Chris's recipe exactly, but... <laughs> but I didn't have a way to except <laughs> I didn't have a way to get my temperature at 62 degrees. So my ferment's at 73, and uh, it's going faster than, uh, than than Chris's is because of the temperature difference. I'm sure. That's uh, yeah. well. That's going to be okay because it'll, I mean, if you're within the yeast tolerance, that's fine. Uh, it's just going to take a little bit longer to mellow out and, and you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, be drinkable, but you, but you're fine. Yeah, waiting, uh, waiting an extra couple of months, uh, that's not going to, that's not a deal breaker. Uh, but when you start getting up at 80 degrees, you know, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this, this is just a one gallon batch. So it's not, you know, it's, it's radiating its heat outside the fermenter better than a three gallon or a five gallon or a six gallon would due to the you know, it's got a lot of surface area for the volume of meat that's fermenting. So, yeah, yeah. Now, how's your uh, how, how's your batch coming? I know you've been putting up the gravity readings, and uh, it sounds like you're right on par. Yeah, I started it on June fifteenth, and the original gravity was one point one four four. It dropped on the first day, twenty four hours later, is one point one two four. So, I had a twenty point drop that day. The third day, it was 1.084. I dropped 40 points that day. Wow. Uh, the fourth day, it was uh, 1.052. And uh, I'm sorry, that was the third day was 1.052. Fifth day was 1.042. And um, the last time I checked, it was 1.036. And I've just cut it under airlock now. And I'm not stirring it anymore and going to let it do its thing. Yeah. Well, uh, it sounds like you're uh, right on schedule, huh? What do you think, Chris? Yeah, if it's a, and if you've got a one-gallon batch going and it's already down to that point, uh, you could probably go ahead and stick that thing in the bottom of your fridge if it'll fit. Uh, of course, you're going to have to have your airlock on there. Uh, 
but I'd go ahead and stick it in the fridge because it's low enough now that uh, uh, the the cold over the next two weeks will help to settle that yeast out, and that'll make it even clearer when you rack the secondary. So um, you might want to go ahead and do that. And while I'm thinking about that, talking about secondary, uh, there's something I forgot to put on that list that we need to add on the website. People need to get... Um, <clears throat> I would get probably three or four empty clean wine bottles or maybe like a half gallon jug or something because we're going to have some excess. Now, I don't know what you did on the one gallon. I don't know how you scale that down, but for those of you who followed the recipe exactly, uh, you probably ended up with closer to four gallons and that was on purpose because we're going to save a little aside to uh, top up with. Now, if if you did make exactly one gallon or just a tad over or whatever, and you don't have extra, that's okay. We can top up with water later on, and it's not going to make that big of a difference. Um, but yeah, grab a grab three or four extra wine bottles for those of you who have the three gallon batch going. You probably know by now it's like four gallons actually, uh, and we're going to save a little back to top up with. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, I'm going to end up, I, I've got some extra must, uh, I mean, extra volume because uh, I use a little bit shy of a gallon of Ozarka spring water and one and a half quarts of honey, and I just used a third of the bottle of the mm-hmm. uh, cherry uh, concentrate. Mm-hmm. That yeah. should get you about, you used how much How much water, spring water? I'm looking at the, the gallon jug of Ozarka, and it's got maybe 10%, maybe 20% left in it. Okay, let's see. And that's not, those Ozarkas, they're not a full gallon. They're like, they're a little under a gallon, actually. Uh, this one actually, this one actually is. Walmart started selling the full gallons. They, they used to sell just the three-liter bottles. Yeah, it was, yeah, okay. Yeah, that, so it's a full gallon. So let's so see, that's one. And then, yeah, you've probably got a little under a gallon and a half. Yeah, that's about what I was figuring. Yeah. Okay. Just so you guys know, I have ordered the uh, the temperature controller, and it's come in, and I'm looking for a old refrigerator or a chest pipe freezer now. So I can, uh, in the future, you know, hold it down in the mid to low 60s. Perfect. Hey, yeah. did you uh, did you take my advice on that T-shirt idea? I didn't, Chris, because it was just a one gallon. Um, I didn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't wrap the T-shirt around it and keep it wet. So, so you that's probably yeah. Well, show that of fermentation. Yeah, you can uh, you can easily drop it. Uh, if you were at seventy three, you could have easily dropped it to sixty three uh, or sixty four. Uh, with no, with nothing more than a shallow pan and a t-shirt. Um, and if you're using a two gallon or a five gallon, uh, plastic bucket, you can take an extra large t-shirt and you can stretch the neck of it around the bucket from the bottom up and it'll hold itself because it's tight enough to hold itself. Let the tail of the shirt hang down in the water and turn a fan on it and you can drop the temperature drastically like that. Yeah, I am fermenting in a two-gallon bucket, two-gallon plastic bucket. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you can you can easily do that. That's what I'm doing my coffee experiment in is a two-gallon bucket. And uh, so when I realized I didn't have cooling, I just uh, I stuck it, I stuck a t-shirt around it and uh, checked the temperature, and it was, it was dead on 62 degrees. So yeah. uh, one it, thing it's I decided. Effective. Not to- um, Chris, one thing I decided not to do is the fourth feeding was going to be at the one-third sugar break, and I had blown mm-hmm. completely past that. Um, so I just did, I only only fed it three times instead of four times. Hmm. Yeah, that happens. You know, actually, uh, uh, in the Tosna uh, protocol, it, you, you do the first three feedings, and then you do the last one at the one-third sugar break. But it seems to me that when I use 71B, on the fourth day, I'm always at the one-third sugar break. So I end up doing uh, 
four feedings in a row, like, you know, four days in a row, and that's it. Uh, I've never I had to wait. Day, on day four, I was already down to 1.042, so. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah that was, that's probably that, that warmer temperature probably is what yeah. kicked it into high gear. I'm sure it did. I mean, that's, you know. Uh, and yet, you know, we're dealing with the, I don't know, well, I kind of do. I mean, you back, you guys have been in the nineties down there, but up here in California, Southern California, we've been in the, uh, 112, 100, 113 yesterday. Uh, it was 95 degrees today. It's supposed to get up to a hundred and about a hundred and, uh, about a hundred degrees tomorrow, actually, but. Um, and Scott, uh, Scott, uh, let me, let me warn you about something and everybody else listening. Uh, those of you who are not used to, uh, to fermenting at lower temperatures, if you make, uh, uh, the swamp cooler or if you make JD's cooler or whatever, uh, once you start fermenting at the lower temperatures, uh, don't get worried when your fermentation is not extremely vigorous, okay? You're, you're not going to be dropping 30 and 40 gravity points in 24 hours when you're fermenting at 62 degrees. So if that's what you're used to seeing, uh, once you get on the cooler end, you may go in there and you may think, man, this thing's not going like it's, like it normally does. Well, it's not going to. So don't get worried about that. That's, that's the whole purpose of this. Slow that fermentation down so that you retain that, those aromatics and, and the flavor, and you don't end up with rocket fuel. So it's going to be slower. Yeah. Did we lose them? You still here, Scott? No, I'm still here. Okay. Yeah, yeah I've, uh, I've done. I started making mead back in the fall of 2014 after I retired, and started making mainly uh, Bray Denard's bomb recipes, the Bray's one month mead, which right, uses yeah. the Y E to one three eight eight exclusively. And I can yeah. tell you, I've, I've made batches that fermented very slow with that yeast. I've made batches that fermented very fast. So even, you know, using the same yeast all the time and pretty consistent temperatures, you know, they just sometimes things go faster than others. And I think a lot of it depends on what all you put into the must. Yeah. Yeah. How many natural sure nutrients are there. You bet. All right, Scott. Well, hey, thanks for the call, bud, and uh, thanks for the listener. I know you've been an avid listener from from pretty much day one, and uh, I we do appreciate it. Yeah, I do right. the show, guys. Keep it. All right, Scott. Thanks, man. Well, good luck. All right. All right, Chris Monroe from uh, Corinth, Corinth, Mississippi. I got to get that right. Do I sound Not like a Chris Monroe? Uh, no. Corinth, I'm, uh, Scott Monroe, Chris Monroe. <laughs> Have some more mellow vino, JD. Uh, <laughs> using your Corinthians, there, JD. <laughs> yeah, there's too much, too much going on. Scott from Corinth, Mississippi. Uh, thanks for calling in for the end of the show tonight. Uh, actually, we called him, but he called like three times. I'm trying to get him in and. Oh, thank you, Microsoft, for screwing up Skype. There was nothing wrong with it before. Um, but anyway, uh, I think Chris has put away the soapbox. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to kind of get back on this uh, Boche and Braggot thing a little bit. Um, and the reason being is because, uh, well, a couple of reasons. One, I know Jeff has done some beers in the past, and the Braggot thing is kind of. I, I, I don't know it's kind of the kind of in between mead and beer. Uh, you're using much the same methods of, of making a beer uh, for these braggots, uh, sure. so far as I've read. Um, and then, of course, the bouchets. But uh, let, let's spend a, just a minute on the bouchets. I just wanted to uh, get your thoughts on something. And. Uh, I know you you already know, uh, but for the sake of the show, I caramelized. I, I got a big uh, a twenty three quart pressure cooker the other day, and uh, you know, first thing I had to do obviously was caramelize some honey. So I had done two quarts of um, 
mesquite honey uh, at 80 minutes at 15 pounds pressure. Uh, and that, that's actually quite a bit. I mean, that, that thing was humming right along. And it came out, I mean, it is absolutely molasses black. Uh, it's got a very definite uh, uh, dark caramel aroma, roasted marshmallow over a campfire, uh, very strong um, flavor to it. And uh, I thought, well, okay, that's, uh, you know, set those on the shelf and grab two more quarts. So I thought, well, let's get two quarts of wildflower and two quarts of mesquite and let's do these at 60 minutes for uh, at 10 pounds pressure and so the result of that was really strange okay the the uh, mesquite honey came out almost exactly like the one although not nearly as uh, strong uh, but it came out nearly the same as the original two that I did at 80 minutes at 15 pounds. Very strong, uh, almost molasses. The first whiff is almost molasses-like, and it kind of goes into this dark caramel, followed by this campfire roasted marshmallow, and that's kind of the taste that you get. And then finally, you're left with uh, a little bit of bitterness uh, on the tail end. And the wildflower, vastly different. Okay, vastly different. Uh, the wildflower changed colors maybe by one shade. Uh, it's still very light, uh, you know, and, and it's an amber color, not the light amber color that the, the typical wildflower that I get is. Um, it smells, cuts, cuts, it's got the best smell. It smells like a fresh batch of light caramel. Um, and the aroma, it's it, it just got this caramel aroma. It tastes like a light caramel uh, in the very beginning, very sweet, a very light roasted uh, taste at the very end, virtually no bitterness whatsoever. And so I thought I'd get your comments, uh, both of you, on what do you think is the difference between these two honey? What, what would cause one to be so much different than the other, I wonder? Well, um, you know, the, the short answer is it's the nectar that the bees have been eating. Um, there, we know for a fact, and I think uh, if Aaron were here, he would be able to tell you a little bit more about uh, how there's there's been analysis done on the different kind of sugar contents in um, like the the honeys that he was experimenting with in his varietal honeys. Um, the long story short of it is, I think the the flowers are producing different sugars. They're doing different things. You may end up with a different water content between the two honeys. Um, so there are a few different factors that could be at play here. There, uh, there is a, a, a potentially a lot going on. Chris, you got any ideas? Mm, I, I wish I had more experience with Bochets. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. Um, I'm going to go with Jeff. I'm going to say it's going to be uh, sugar content, uh, sugar concentration of the honey, the types of sugars there, uh, obviously that uh, different kinds of sugars are going to caramelize at different temperatures. Uh, they're going to yeah. uh, reach, uh, you know, the different stages of uh, candy making, I guess you would say, at different temperatures. Uh, so all that's going to affect it, and every single honey is going to be different. Now, in the case of maltose, if you've got any maltose in the honey, uh, then you're going to go through a conversion process where, uh, you know, the same way that you would with beer. Uh, when you are boiling beer, uh, you're converting some of the starches. And, uh, yeah. you know, this this gets into a science of brewing that, that I'm not that familiar with. Yeah. So, um, 
And I, I really, and I don't really want to get into the science. And I, you know, I guess you start getting. I, for some people, I guess they get an enjoyment out of that. But I don't do it for the science. I do it for the fun and to drink. But I, you know, I was just curious. So why such vastly different outcomes? Uh, and I agree with you on the on the sugar because the the wildflower that I get from my source. It is so sweet. And, Chris, if you remember that little sample I sent you, uh, or, well, actually, that, those, those couple of quarts that I sent you down there, it, it's still just as sweet. So there's a high sugar content in in this wildflower. The mesquite, not nearly as, as sweet as the wildflower. So I'm, you know, that was my first inclination, that maybe something had to do something with the sugar content in it. So... Uh, yeah, and even though you notice uh, you notice differences after after you've caramelized them, uh, I think the really big difference is going to come when you ferment it because uh, depending on what kinds of sugars that are in there and what stage they reach, uh, there's going to be some that are going to become unfermentable. So one honey done exactly like the other, uh, you know, and put in the same exact mead. You may come out with a residual sweetness that's very different from one batch to another. Well, they're uh, they've go you know uh, the quarts of honey, both uh, you know the, the mesquite and the wildfire. They've all got uh, little post-it notes on top. Uh, they're being reserved for JD's next experiment, and uh, it's simply going to be a traditional using both of those uh, honeys. Uh, I'm just going to throw it in the pot with some water, add some yeast, and, uh, you know, come up with the same gravity points, same yeast, same nutrients, same same ball game, and uh, we'll see where we, you know, see what happens. I mean, that's... Uh, uh, well, you know, we talked about early on when we first started this show, we started talking about experimentation, and I think now maybe people can see what we were talking about uh, these, uh, you know, you had Aaron doing all these different, uh, uh, varietals, uh, comparing those. You got Jeff who's doing all the, the test with the different nutrient schedules and regimens. Yeah. Uh, we're doing, uh, now, now you've got this Boucher thing. Uh, you've got a whole string of experiments that could be done there with, uh, different levels of caramelization and different honeys and, uh, so, you know, you can see where this experimentation thing can, can turn into a, a huge, and that's what, that, that's what the mead industry needs. That's what the mead world needs because that's what the wine industry has already done. Right. And they've gotten their answers and we need to get our answers. Well, yeah, uh, you know, and I, and I'm sure maybe somebody, if I put the question out there to somebody, uh, you know, I'm sure if I went over to Got Mead, I could probably, you know, post a question up and, you know, within a day or two get an answer. But uh, I just thought it was the most, you know, when I, when I popped the lid off the pressure cooker and I pulled the jars out and set them on the counter, I thought, wait a minute, did I just pull those out or did I forget to put them in? You know, uh, it was just so wildly different, uh, on the, you know, on those two hunting. Let's talk braggots, Jeff. Um, this is, uh, you know, I'm still exploring my 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 fermenting uh, uh, hobby here, and I'm I'm venturing off into beers. I've got a couple of beer kits here that I want to do, uh, and uh, I do want to get involved in doing, uh, you know, a few braggots uh, here and there, but. Basically, what 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 is a braggot all about again? I, I know we talked a little bit about it last uh, last week on the show, but what's what, what what's a braggot again? Well, a braggot, to to put it simply, is uh, is a malt from a grains um, that has been added to a, a mead. Um, the uh, the long and short of it is that uh, as long as the honey is the major fermentable sugar and not the malt, uh, it is a braggot. If it's uh, if it's mostly malt with some honey flavoring, or the honey is the secondary fermentable sugar, then you've got a beer flavored with honey. Um, that's as far as the technicalities go. 
I mean, the field is really wide open from there. I mean, we've got uh, all kinds of different ways we can do this. There are uh, liquid and dry malt extracts you can just add to your mead. Um, there's all kinds of those options available to you. If you want to get a little bit more complicated with it, you can do a partial steep uh, where you have some of your grains coming from a uh, – that have been essentially milled and broken up, and you'll, uh, you'll boil those in some water, and then you'll add the, the malt extract later. Um, you can even go all grain and um, get uh, get your entire grain bill, steep it all up, and then add your your mead to it once you're done. Um, and I would I would approach it that way so that you uh, you're uh, adding honey to a, a well not hot but at least around 90 degree warm uh, yeah must or I, I should say wort at that point uh, if we're going to be technical. Um, that will just aid in, in adding that honey together and make things a little bit easier for you. Um, and you, uh, well, and I mean, part of, part of the deal here is you, you still, cause we all know that by heating honey, you lose some of the characteristics that it, it presents. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, it, it should be treated like you were making a meat. On the other hand, the, the uh, malt and hop part of it is treated like you were making a beer. So I, I assume you would start out boiling your, your while well, steeping your grains, if that if that's the case. Mm-hmm. If not, uh, you know, bringing your water up to temperature, adding your malt, bringing it to a boil, make your right. hop additions. I mean, you're going through the whole process of making a beer, but you bring it down to temperature. And then add your honey, which is your primary fermentable. So, you know, right. in place of making a beer, you've reduced that liquid malt or dry malt, and making that up, making up the difference with the with the honey. I mean, it sounds like a simple process to me. No, well, it, it's it can be very simple. It can be very com- complicated. You know, much like meat, it's as much work as you want to put into it. Um, but yeah, I would definitely do the the beer brewing part of it first because you're requiring a higher temperature and more control. Um, you know, there are a bunch of different ways to approach a grain extract, um, but generally you have a few longer steeping temperatures um, in the neighborhood of you know, 138 degrees, 144 degrees. You want to mash out, I think, somewhere between 168 and 172. I'm kind of an amateur at beer, so for those of you listening at home, if I'm getting this wrong, Bear with me. Um, the, uh, but uh, beyond that's all that, right. That's all right. Yeah, I'm, six, I'm, I'm 63 years old. My wife says I'm still an amateur of making the bed, so don't worry about. It. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, and then I would I would cool the, the the wort that you end up with from the brewing process to at least 95 degrees. Uh, and the reason I say 95 degrees because 95 degrees is actually the the ambient temperature inside a beehive. Yeah. Uh, that is that is the temperature that the bees like. Uh, beyond that, you do start losing some of those volatile aromatics in your honey, um, and your results will will not show the full honey care. Uh, that may be a good thing. That may be a bad thing. I mean, we're talking about uh, Boucher's a minute ago, and that changes the honey character. That may be what you're going for. I've I've talked numerous times about the uh, the porter. Uh, Boucher that I made that yeah. just turned out completely fantastic. It, I, you know, boiled the spray, well, caramelized the snot out of that honey, and it, at 18 months now, it tastes fantastic. Yeah, is that a Boucher? <laughs> it is now. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> I uh, I might be interested in that recipe uh, as soon as I get uh, a simple one under my belt. But go ahead, Chris. Uh, it's either a Bragashay or a Bogar. Bogar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but not a Humphrey, right? <laughs> no. So, um, well, you know, in beer making, you know, after getting involved in all this, I mean, I, you know, I'm retired. I'm wondering, oh, now what do I do? And I thought, you know, I've seen these beer kits. Every time I go to BevMo or, or, or my total wine out here and I see these damn beer kits, 
And I'm thinking, God, I maybe, I, maybe I should make some homemade beer. And I, and I kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And then I started, you know, looking into it and getting a little bit more serious about it and started, I thought, well, maybe I better study it first. And that was my first inclination was to do beer. That's when I discovered this meat. And I thought, well, what the hell is this stuff? Uh, so I went that direction. So I'm, I'm still, I still want to get into the beer making. I, I, I've got, I bought two kits that I'm going to make here. I've got all the equipment. And that's another thing. Um, we're talking a little bit different equipment here. Are we or are we not? It depends on how involved you want to be with this. I mean, if you're, if you're just doing a, uh, um, an all um, extract recipe. You probably just need a big stock pot. Um, you know your your standard measuring equipment. Um, you might want to get a, you know, a a grain bag or a a hop bag. Um, that way you, you can separate that stuff out easily. Um, but you're not asking for a lot more involvement. Um, if you do get into all grain, then you get more stuff like. Um, well, you, you need a mash ton, you need uh, this, that, or the other, or you can go the, the brew in the bag route, which I think if I'm going to continue brewing beer um, is going to be the direction I go, um, just for simplicity's sake. Um, yeah. And really it gives you a little bit more, um, what do I want to say, uh, a little bit more latitude with what you can do with a small investment in equipment, I think. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's attractive to me. Um I think the biggest the biggest addition investment really is in time, isn't it? Oh, probably. I mean, we're talking about yeah. uh, you know you can put a mead together in um, well an hour, hour and a half, um, like Chris did the other night. Maybe two hours if you're going to go through all the sanitizing steps and not count that, or and, uh, count that into your your process. Um, the brewing and all grain um, can be a, an afternoon affair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I could do it a lot faster than that if I wasn't trying to talk and carry on a conversation and not drop my phone in the bucket. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's, uh, I mean, there's a part of that too. I mean, there's a sixty-minute boil, uh, you know, that you've got to be pretty darn attentive. I mean, you just can't yep. fire it up and walk away. I mean, there's right. some 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 awful things can happen when you're. Uh, you know, boiling a you know a five gallon stock pot full of uh, uh, you know what 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 can consider considerably can conceivably uh, be called napalm at times. I mean, it's a, it's a sticky it's a sticky mess. So mm-hmm. um, well, and if you're using dry malt extract, especially, you've got to be careful for the first about five to ten minutes after you add that stuff um, because that is. It's a really fine powder, and you're you're not aware initially how much of a nucleation point that gives you, um, but you can get surprise bubble up with that, and it will foam like hell. Um, and it's it's a little bit um, unpredictable as to when that's going to happen. But once it starts, you've got to really stir that for a good five to ten minutes uh, before you can start seeing the uh, the liquid wort again, um, and then you know, you're past it. Um, yeah, there's there's a major risk of boil over at that point if you're not attentive to it. Chris, have you done any? Yeah, I won't do that. Beer, no. Uh, but I did. I sent Jeff and Aaron. And I think I sent it to you too. The uh, recipe for my um, red Irish ale bracket. Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, I I can't say it's mine. I lifted it off of uh, Ken Schram. It's his recipe. So. Uh, uh, have you tried that yet, Jeff? I've, I've not gotten a chance to. I've the only braggot I've done so far has been this porter and boche. Um, and it's one of those that I've been uh, I've been kind of eyeballing for closer to next winter uh, for experimenting with because uh, mm-hmm. you know, like I've said a couple times, I'm on a big fruit kick right now, I'm trying to get my my melomels, uh under my belt here. Mm-hmm. But, so now that I've got that under my belt, now I'm trying to do other things. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So we're we're both trying to branch out. I um something else that I uh, I kind of want to run by you too. I uh, Chris is is well aware of this. 
I had the Sourwood project go on. This is something that uh, I was eager to do because Chris had sent me uh, a gallon of uh, Sourwood honey uh, from uh, from Miss. Well, actually, it came from Tennessee, I believe. Um, Smoky Mountain, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's got a it's got a pretty unique flavor. I really like it, and uh, so he he suggested doing a, a a traditional, which I did. Uh, and and using uh, you know a particular yeast strain, which I did, um, everything came together just fine, and it percolated away just fine. And suddenly it it it's like not doing anything. And I think what we have here is a stuck fermentation. Uh, if you haven't run across one of those or haven't had one. Just uh, uncross your fingers because it's going to happen one time or another. Um, so here I sit. Now, there are several methods out there to restart your fermentation. I'm going to tell you about one that failed. Uh, and these, these are, you know, when you Google stuck fermentation, there are countless websites and information that comes up about how to restart them. And all of them say the same thing. I mean, if it's not verbatim, it's basically the same thing. One of them is take a half a gallon of your uh, mead, your must, and uh, add a, a table or a teaspoon and a half to two teaspoons of a yeast energizer. I did, and one packet of a killer or champagne yeast. I did. It was eleven sixteen. Uh, mix them well, cover loosely, place them in a warm spot. I did. Once you have a vigorous fermentation, you can add it back to the original must. Well, I'm still waiting for that half gallon to fire off and start bubbling. The second method uh, that I'm working on right now, which which I, I, I'm absolutely positive it's going to work, because I have a mini volcano happening over here on my... Uh, I should actually take a picture of it uh, and put it on a Facebook. Um, this is a, uh, it's in a little quart bottle right now, but uh, you just take a half a cup of warm water, you dissolve one teaspoon of sugar in it, and then add a little bit of orange juice. Uh, different pages will tell you anywhere from a half a cup to a cup of orange juice. 90 degrees is what you're looking at. So bring the sugar water and the orange juice up to 90 degrees. Pitch your yeast, again, 1116 or 1118. This time it was 1118. Wait till it really gets working. Well, that was in about 10 minutes. Uh, and then now I have to go through this process. It's actually it's going to be a lengthy process, guys, because a little bit at a time. So we're talking to start with, maybe two cups, okay, I have to start acclimating my starter to the must just a little bit at a time. And, the, you know, the longer I go, the more I can add. So uh, so I'm going from this quart jar, it'll go into a gallon jug, and then as soon as I get the gallon jug full, full that'll get racked into another three-gallon carboy, and then so I can start adding the original must and just keep working at it until I get all the must transferred from one carboy to the next. Now, the yeast that I used was D21. Okay? But there's a problem. Okay? There's a problem. The D21 that I used was Scott Labs D21. It wasn't Lalvin. And I think that might be the culprit. I think. Now, we're not slamming Scott Labs here, you know, pointing the finger. But I think that may have been the problem. So, uh, Jeff, what do you think? Well, um, you know, there, there's probably no end of preferences as far as one yeast company versus the other out there. Um it's certainly possible you may have gotten a bum batch of mead the first time through and it may have stalled out. The question that I wanted, uh, that what I would ask first though is, um, why did it stall? And 
So what do your stats look like? I mean, what's your what's your uh, gravity set look like? What's your pH look like? Um, starting starting gravity was uh, one point one three two. It it quit at uh, one point zero four four. Okay. And uh, I mean, it should have gone way below that uh, in the last eighteen days. Mm-hmm. And uh, the pH was right on par, three point three. Uh, temp fermentation temperature was sixty eight degrees. So, <laughs> uh, you know, mm-hmm. it, this is the pulling hair part. You know what happened. Uh, and the only thing I can think of is when I when I went through my my yeast uh, because I inventory my I, I have a lot of yeast on hand because I hate I hate making trips to the Bruce job so I got a lot of yeast in my refrigerator and I keep kind of a running list uh, right in the in the jar with my yeast in the refrigerator so I got the list out and lo and behold I, I thought I had used the Lalvin D21 I didn't I used the Scott Labs that I had that uh, that I had gotten I think it came from one of the online stores that I ordered something uh, well, are you <laughs> sure it was Scott's Labs oh yeah yeah I'm absolutely sure yeah because I keep a pretty okay. good little list I've, I've got a little inventory of what I have and what I used uh, in my, uh, it, it stays right in the jar, right in the jar that I keep my my yeast in. Yeah. So but that's not a is, slam, like you said. It's not a slam on Scott Labs. It's just a bad batch of yeast, most likely because you've ruled out pretty much everything else. Now, the only thing that you could do, you'd have to have a test kit to do it, but uh, you would need to to test uh, your total acidity, and you would need to test your free SO2 levels, um, but that's unlikely. It really is unlikely that that's going to affect anything, uh, especially in a traditional. I don't think the, the total acidity is going to be a, an issue. Uh, free SO2 could be, but I doubt it. Um, it was, uh, you know, I stirred. I went beyond the seven days with the stirring because it, it, the D twenty one. I've used D twenty one before, and it's a it, it's a lot like seventy one B. I mean, it it produces a massive amount of gas, uh, and uh, you know, I, I did this. This is a four gallon batch that I did in my seven total gallon fermenter. And even when it was at the four gallon mark, all right, when I stirred it up for the first few times, it came right to the top uh, of the ferment. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, it, uh, and it did that, you know, for the first couple, two, three days. And then after that, I mean, it's still, uh, every time I would put it, uh, put my stirrer in a stir, why, well, it, it really foamed up a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. So, I know it puts out a lot of CO2, but I, I kept stirring a, after the uh, my stirs got more gentler after the seventh day uh, because you don't want to introduce more oxygen after that point. It's had enough, uh, so the stirring that you do is basically just uh, you know off gas, uh, you know the uh, the carbon dioxide buildup, and, and that's what I was doing. I did that for a few days, uh, you know after yeah. that, so. And, and something that people need to know here, uh, this is beyond uh, a simple case of repitching because you're over 11% alcohol. Yeah. Uh, so you can't just pitch more yeast into that. It's just going to kill them. No. Yeah. Uh, so uh, doing a starter and then slowly acclimating it, and you said two cups. Uh, if you've got a, basically a cup of starter, I probably wouldn't add two cups of must to that on the first edition. I'd probably no. go less than that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I intend on going a lot less than that uh, because I want to, you know, I mean, this, this honey came all the way from frickin' Mississippi, for crying out loud. <laughs> you know, I don't want to ruin this batch of me just because I got a bad batch of yeast. So uh, that's why I've tried a couple of different. I'm still I'm still keeping an eye on this other half gallon uh, bottle of uh, starter that I did. I'm not completely uh, done with that yet. So I'm still keeping an eye on. I added a little. I, I mixed up a little bit of honey and some water, 
uh, and I and I threw that in, uh, you know, thinking that maybe it just needs a little, you know, a little bit more sugar uh, to see what happens. And uh, but we'll keep an eye on that. But this other one, the little one that I made, it's taken off like gangbusters. Um, so I'm just going to keep working with that, and then just a little bit at a time, start working it in. Uh, I've already got a three-gallon carboy. It's already been sanitized with a piece of saran wrap over the top, ready to go. Uh, I got everything ready to go. So, uh, but anyway, I, yeah, I just thought I'd run it by you. I mean, it's you know, uh, and I don't know. You know, I've heard uh, I've heard that these you know just because of the D twenty one from Malavlin doesn't mean it's the same as a D twenty one from from Scott Labs either. So I'm not it's quite sure what they supposed to be. Is, supposed to be. It's probably just a, probably just a bad batch uh, for whatever reason. I mean, it happens. But I, I've got a saying I told you earlier: uh, if you buy a pickup, make sure it's a Ford. If you buy a car, make sure it's a Nissan, and if you buy yeast, make sure it's Lowland. <laughs> there you go. Um, good deal. So uh, anyway, the last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, we were talking about one of the shows here in the past. We were talking about some of the must-have items that you you really need to have in your in your your mead-making toolkit. And I, I wanted to spend a few, just a few minutes uh, to tell on the show here, talking about the probably the single most important thing uh, that you could have, and that's a leaf stirrer. If you don't have one of those, don't even bother starting to make me. And they come in different formats. Now, the first one, I got to tell you, the first one that I ever used, I, I saw this thing. I, I don't know if it was on Amazon. I don't even know where the, where I saw this thing, but it was like thirty bucks. And I thought, wait a minute, uh, I can go to the hardware store and pick up a paint stirrer for seven bucks and do the same thing. Well, that's what I did. So uh, I went, I, you know, I used that for the first, uh, you know, before I got all set up with the fermenters and stainless steel units that I have, but uh, a a paint stirrer. Works right, guys. In the bucket, yeah. Yeah, in a bucket. In bucket. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, you know, take a trip to the hardware store. I mean, you know, they run between seven and ten bucks. They attach to a drill, uh, and uh, they make perfectly good, uh, you know, stirs. Now, I'd fuck yeah, and I, I can guarantee you. Last week, if if someone was following along making that cherry mead. And they didn't have a, some sort of drill powered stirrer, and they were trying to do it with a slotted spoon. Uh, they somebody was cussing somewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and can guarantee you. Uh, now, if you're making a one gallon batch, uh, a spoon is is completely adequate for mixing, for degassing, for everything. And you can manage a one-gallon batch with no problem. But when you get anything above that, you better have some way to stir or you're going to have a very tired arm. Yeah. Now, I tell you, for uh, you know, for the small batches that I do, I, I do them in these food-grade buckets that I got from the uh, restaurant supply store. And they have an airtight lid that goes on them. And uh, I, I actually use a whisk, a wire whisk, a stainless steel wire whisk. Uh, and uh, I can put it in the bucket and just, uh, you know, whisk the crap out of it. I'm aerating at the same time, uh, and it stirs everything all up, and, uh, you know, for my small batches. But, uh, you know, the lee stirrer, uh, the one I have has got the two little, little wing things on the end of it. They're perfect because they go down inside the neck of a three- to five-gallon carboy. Uh, and if you're doing it, well, even after you rack the first time, it's still a good idea to go in there and kind of kind of stir things up, just a gentle stir, keep that yeast suspended a little bit as it finishes out in secondary. Uh, you know, and that's the perfect little tool. A little degassing along yeah, the way. Yeah, if you're doing. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. I just said a little degassing along the way never hurt. I found uh, 
that that gas buildup tends to to drop my uh, my pH, and I definitely like a little bit of a uh, 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 help getting that uh, under control, even into secondary. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're, if you're doing a, a surely surely uh, aging, you're going to have to stir up the leaves uh, for that, and you're going to need that to get down in the carboy, and then. If you plan on using any sort of fining agents, you're going to need to degas it uh, either by vacuum method or if you have to drill stir it, then you're going to need that that lee stir to do that with to degas it. Uh, so you're going to and and you know uh, also on this cherry mead we're doing, uh, we're going to be adding this cocoa, and that's going to have to be stirred up some. So. Uh, or, well, that doesn't have to be, but it needs to be. So, uh, yeah, that's that's another little implement that people definitely need to get. Yeah. Well, and the uh, uh, the uh, the DYI part of this uh, little stirring thing, uh, along with the with the paint stir that you get from the hardware store. If you do have a one gallon uh, or even a three gallon carboy, uh, I made my own little agitator for degassing uh, before I had my little looster that I broke down and bought for nine twenty seven dollars or something. I took a a, a plastic coat hanger. Uh, I waited until my wife went to work, and I, I, I and I was sure to I was sure to grab one of my shirts off of a plastic coat. And I cut the the hook part off, and then just went to the stove, uh, and I bent the uh, bent the ho- the coat hanger, and uh, on one end of it, I uh, I just kind of kind of modified it to to give it a you know put a little few bends in it here and there to uh, make it a good little agitator. So I have fits in my drill. I stick it down the uh, down the neck of the uh, carboy and. Uh, it does a hell of a job for uh, you know degassing uh, while it's in the carboy, and it, it worked pretty good on my little one gallon carboys as well too. So uh, you know if you want to shell out the thirty bucks for the for the little Easter, uh, you know look around the closet if you got a plastic coat hanger, uh, you know uh, that might be a uh, you know alternative. So uh, you'd be surprised at what kind of mead tools you can find laying around the house. Um, Once again, just like with the cooling deal, there's no excuse. If you really want to do it bad enough, you'll find a way. Well, yeah. Um, you know, and uh, we, we've had a hell of a good time doing it, too. You know, a yeah. uh, few mistakes here and there, but what the heck. I mean, we got this coffee thing going. Uh, you know, and I haven't put that to bed yet either because this caramelized honey that I have, uh, the original two uh, that I did that came out really dark. That's going to be uh, used with another coffee experiment. Um, uh, so we're you know and, and we're working on the on the ones that we got uh, right now. That's kind of on the back burner, just kind of doing their things. I've, uh, although mine, I mean, that was another one that kind of stalled out on me too. We're still trying to figure that one out. But I've got a couple of others in its place that are that are doing well. Um, and uh, so, you know, in future shows, we'll be we'll, we'll be talking more and more about the coffee thing as they, you know, mature a little bit more. Uh, just want to remind all of our listeners, I mean, God, we're, we're getting like hundreds of downloads uh, of the show. Uh, we got one more show next week, then we're off for two weeks. So uh, we do six and two. We do six weeks on, two weeks off. Take a little bit of a, gri- a break, regroup. Um, and... Uh, you know, uh, come back and do it again. So we got one more show in this six week stint. Uh, Aaron won't be back with us until we come back. Uh, after that, uh, he's going to be off for a couple of weeks. Uh, but, uh, we're always in touch with them. But the guys, I don't have anything else to talk about. Do you? I, I can't think of anything. We, uh, just let people know if you are doing this project along with us, we will, uh, give you instructions next week on what you need to do uh, while we're off because you're going to need to rack this thing uh, July the 5th. So uh, we'll cover all that. And I do think Aaron is going to be back next week. I believe yeah. so, yeah. 
Oh, well, maybe maybe it will. I know I know there's a couple of dates that that he was going to be off, but uh, either way. Um, and again, you know, the three people that emailed Chris, uh, you know, we we know uh, we know that you're trying, and uh, you know, keep the emails coming. We're 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 happy to help you out. We want to do anything we can uh, for you to uh, make sure you're doing it, uh, doing it the right way. So please follow the recipe. Yeah, and I appreciate I appreciate the emails, and 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 I'm being hard on you uh, for a reason. Uh, I, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings or, or be mean about it. You know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm I'm doing this for a reason. I want you to make good news, and uh, you just you just got to learn when to do things and when not to do them and so I guess it's what tough love or something <laughs> tough love alright guys that's gonna that's gonna wrap it up for tonight so uh, hey what do you say we come back next week and do it all again we'll see you next week <laughs>